Hello, and welcome to The Charge Cycle, an electrifying new podcast on all things fleet electrification. I'm Todd Trauman. I'm the CEO of Emission Control. If you are a procurement manager, a fleet operator, or one of the millions of people tasked with a zero emission deployment goal, this podcast is for you. We speak with industry experts, funding experts, OEMs, and many others to help you stay ahead of this enormous electrification shift underway. Hello and welcome back to The Charge Cycle, an electrifying new podcast on all things fleet electrification. I'm Todd Traum and I'm the CEO of Emission Control and the host here. And today we are very lucky to have Chris White, Senior Manager of Frontier Energy, join us. Chris is a very well-respected industry veteran in the clean energy, clean transportation space with a expertise really in electric mobility, electric buildings, energy efficiency in buildings, and most importantly, efficient people. Chris, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me today. So I'd love to hear a little bit more about Frontier and your background here, um, but I have to ask, kind of going on the theme of Frontier, um, you know, you've been a pioneer in this space for a very long time. Uh, based on your, you know, your history in this area, especially your history out here on the West Coast, are, are, we, um, are we still in the uh, finding gold flex under the mill from John Sutter stage, or are we in the the full-fledged gold rush here? I think we're somewhere in between. We've identified a lot of different gold flux, and those flux are batteries and fuel cells and renewable fuels that are made from things that we've thrown away before. So we know what they are, we know where they're hiding, and now we've got to figure out how we bring those flux of gold into the marketplace. But we do it sustainably and efficiently, and we we don't to make some of the mistakes that we made in the gold rush with destroying the world around mm-hmm. us to get what, to what was precious. That sounds great. We're ringing the bell, just getting things going, but making sure we do it in the right way in the right time is very, very important. Um, so just backing up a little bit, I would love to hear a little bit more about your personal background and your involvement in Frontier and a bit more on just kind of what Frontier does. Sure. So my background, um, I've been with Frontier for almost 18 years now. And I started by working with the California Fuel Cell Partnership, uh, which is a Frontier Energy client, but uh, bringing this new idea to market. And before that, I worked for IBM. All I've ever really done is worked with things that are not for sale or just for sale, and really look at what systems need to be put in place, what behaviors need to change, what do we do to enable people to do something better cheaper or faster than they've done before. And that's where we are today, is really looking at how we take new mobility options. And that really spans the gamut into doing bike share and car share. Those aren't very common yet either. Um, How we transform transit from stop to stop to door to door. How do we make those systems work in the ways that make people more effective? That's great. And I love the focus on transportation, but I know that's not everything that Frontier does, right? Um, what else, uh, what other kind of pies do you have your fingers in here these days? Frontier Energy runs the, Calipor- the California Fuel Cell Partnership, which I've mentioned. Mm-hmm. We also run the Food Service Technology Center, which is the leading lab in the world for making energy efficient equipment and water efficient equipment for restaurants and commercial food providers. We work on building codes and standards. We do investigation into really interesting new energy systems for buildings or for microgrids. So we're all about how we pull all of those pieces together from power generation to power use in a building and now to bringing that power into a parking lot. Yeah, that makes sense. And it feels like really the same person is often tasked with energy efficiency upgrades across an entire facility. It might not just be their fleet that they're having to look at, but definitely a lot of building efficiency that they have. Maybe it goes into the manufacturing of the products that they're developing, or if they're a farm on how they uh, might manage their energy efficiency projects. Um, So I'd love to get back to a lot of that, um, just kind of at the tail end, but just taking one step back towards transportation. That's a big focus of the day. It's a huge part of the IRA, for example. And, um, you know, it's uh, today's day and age is really kind of the first foray for a lot of these folks that are looking at electrification. Maybe they're starting their first little bit of research on how to find their first F-150 Lightning to get integrated into their operations, or maybe they're a little beyond that. But 
uh, the vast majority of people um, working in the kind of commercial sector, especially out here on the West Coast, are, are really on the early stages of this. Um, and for people in this in the space like you and I, maybe it's a little bit closer to the gold rush than not. But to them, it's very early days. A lot of these people are turning towards Google, turning towards some other just very generic resource, maybe someone that they've known that might know something. Um, and one of the common findings is that these people are just immediately overwhelmed with information of all kinds of equipment types, OEMs, what to do with their infrastructure, with funding from different sources all over the place. And, you know, I, I think that they find uh, they find it overwhelming almost immediately. And uh, I think that's really stalling out some of their decision making because they just don't know where to turn. Um, so I'd like to kind of hear your feedback just on that really quickly for the, for the millions of people now in a position where they have to decide what to do next. Uh, where do they turn? Where do they start? So let me just give like a little bit of credential here. We Frontier Energy has been working with fleets for about four years now and doing fleet transition planning. And we've worked with great big fleets with thousands of vehicles. We've worked with tiny fleets that have less than 20. We've worked with folks that are only operating big equipment, big trucks, heavy equipment. We talk to folks who are working only with cars. And um, I've also done a number of focus groups around the country with people who aren't even planning for this yet. And where do we start? So I would say that if you think about it kind of like a rainbow, we have people at all parts of that rainbow on where they are and what they're doing. Some are really excited to do it and have a lot of buy-in from everybody. Others feel like they're being forced to do it. Mm -hmm. So we really have to look at where you're starting. And so we tell our clients, the first thing to do is find your why. What's driving this? Is it greenhouse gas emission reduction? Is it an opportunity to save money? Do you wanna be a technical leader? Is it because there's funding coming available or funding that you need to use? So look at the why and for most folks, it's not one why, it's many. And then we figure out where those whys line up and overlap. What we have seen with fleets is there are two kind of approaches. Approach number one is let's develop policies first and goals and targets. The other is let's go, we got money, let's put a charging station in without really knowing what we're doing or having a plan. And so we want to look at both ends of those spectrums. And, and our advice is to do both at the same time. Do not just go out and start plunking charging stations in the ground. Let's think about it a little bit more. Let's figure out like any other capital expenditure or any other building project you're doing, let's treat those charging stations like a capital expense. Let's figure out how you get there and let's develop the policies, the practices, the procedures at the same time. That's great. and. You know, I think that a lot of those fleets are starting to uh, understand or now, as as you put it, starting to put a little planning uh, ahead, you know, try to get the heart with the, the horse before the cart here. Um, on the planning side, you know, there's a lot of still questions on how, how do I even start planning? Um, one of the things that I heard you say in the past was that I thought was very interesting was that, you know, the first kind of uh, option someone might turn to, especially on the zero emission vehicle deployment front is, TCO, total cost of ownership, and I have to put together a total cost of ownership. I have to justify this expense in the long term. And I, I think people are finding some success to that. But you uh, highlighted um, in, in, in the past that maybe that isn't the right way to look at it entirely or to maybe not uh, spend so much time or get so in the weeds that you're kind of falling back on your, uh, on your progress. Uh, can you really build on that a little bit? Sure. Um, most of the fleets that we've worked with have not done a TCO for their existing vehicles. It is really treated more of a capital expense and then an operating expense. And there isn't really a need to show that this pencils out in the end. Mm -hmm. Now, with putting in something new and battery electric or fuel cell electric vehicles are more expensive than their conventional counterpart. And that we're also putting in some type of infrastructure or using infrastructure to use that. So a total cost of ownership analysis really takes all of those factors. It also figures in what you're getting back, tax credits, incentives, refunds, and the operational savings that you're having to show a break even point. For folks that are operating vehicles for a living, that's a delivery truck, that's somebody who is a more of a commercial operator, they typically use a different accounting method, which is a total cost of operation. Yeah. 
and that takes those factors and breaks them down into per miles of operation, or it has to show a balance sheet for revenue, revenue coming in, when does my revenue pencil out? And it's a little bit of a different accounting method, and they usually need to show a break-even point within three to five years, where a TCO typically t shows a 10-year break point. But when we look at something that is a capital expenditure, building a building, putting in a new fueling station, that's often a different accounting method called life cycle cost analysis. Mm. And in that life cycle cost analysis, we also look at what are the long-term benefits of it? Did it help us retain workers or gain workers? Did it improve a quality of life? So we look at all of those or each of those as the client needs it. But what I really wanna emphasize is most folks see immediate operational savings. Electricity costs less than gasoline. It is also more stable and more predictable. We'll also see that you get some operational gains from maintenance. Some of that is because it's a new car or new truck. Some of it is because there is less belts to change. There are mm -hmm. no belts to change. There are no moving parts. Tires cost what tires cost. You're still gonna have to have to replace tires. You're still gonna have to patch up windshields. They cost what they cost. What we've also seen though, is people who work in the vehicle for a living. That's the bus driver. That's the person who is on the road all day. They are reporting fewer headaches, fewer back aches, less repetitive stress injuries. And so we may be able to see a gain in worker satisfaction and health by driving a zero emission vehicle. I wanna emphasize there's no data to, rep to predict that. We don't know what people's health is, it's protected by law, but I would encourage folks to just take a look at that and see if you're seeing that in your operation. That's great. And to kind of just read that back to you a little bit, it sounds like maybe if someone is thinking about a zero emission vehicle deployment, it's really important to maybe look outside of the TCO box, so to speak, and figure out what data is important to you, what data you might have on hand or not have on hand, and to look at this on a life cycle cost basis, potentially, instead of a TCO basis, figure out where your breakpoint is, hopefully make that within three years, and you can justify that from there. But more importantly, to your point, the ensure that there are societal benefits, so to speak, or at least internal intra-company societal benefits, right? I, I think we've seen the same uh, same thing in the port ecosystem where zero emission yard truck deployment has really made a positive impact on uh, the operators of the equipment in a way that they didn't even expect themselves. Um, and so there's got to be, uh, you know, some discussion, some even if it's subjective in nature, um, having an influence on that decision-making to electrify. We have seen over the... My lifetime anyway, you know, when I was a little girl or first learning to drive, cars didn't even have seat belts in them. <laughs> and the entire discussion about how, how to put seat belts in and what's the benefit of that. In your lifetime, or maybe before your lifetime, we saw the build out of cell phone towers. Those were exorbitantly expensive. And what we've done with wireless internet. So all of those have a societal benefit down the road that we maybe didn't see in the beginning. And as you and I talk here today, I'm looking at your lovely window on the 27th floor in Sacramento on our fifth day of a ridiculous heat wave. And the sky behind you is so smoky and hazy because of forest fires. You know, that's the societal benefit we're gonna see. And are we gonna pay a little bit more for it today? Yes, we are. But if we can preserve our agriculture, preserve the fact that we can, um, one of my staff who lives in Orlando was here. She went to Lake Tahoe yesterday and took a sunset cruise. And she said there was no sunset, but she did see ashes falling from the sky like snow. So how do you put a price tag on that? Uh, I don't think we can, and I think we have to do it and recognize how important that is for our companies and our businesses and our municipalities and our children and our friends and our families and ourselves. Absolutely. So it sounds like there's a way to address both of, the, both of these things, address what's happening in, in your local community, at your local business, but also at a larger level here. Think about what's happening with your state or your country or globally. Uh, all should be part of the calculus. It should not be part of a larger, high, higher discussion at this point. I think that uh, it sounds like people looking at it should incorporate this thinking now, not later, or use it as kind of cream on top uh, benefit for electrifying. It is. Um, I want to talk a little bit too on just kind of the decision-making process. I mean, that, you made a very good case. Again, we, 
you know, I, I have friends and family up in the, the foothills in California. That's where the mosquito fire is today. And so it's very eye opening to see the inherent need and the influence of climate change and what's going on today. And the decision making at any particular fleet um, can be done by maybe a variety of people. And it, uh, because of the, you know, the, the, the requirements for electrifying include infrastructure upgrades. It requires data acquisition from people in the warehouse or the, out in the field or out in the yard and also financial calculations done by somebody in the office. And so what are we seeing about the level of communication or maybe the lack thereof kind of between people in the office spaces and people out in the yards? Is there uh, issues there? Are there ways they can kind of address communications to help make a collective decision? What we have seen with our fleets and also through the focus groups is there is definitely a disconnect from what I'm going to call the C-suite. Mm. And that could be the bosses, but it could be the commission or the board. Um, many of them are very aware of what goes on with battery electric cars. And to them, it looks really simple. Run to the run to the dealership, buy a car, or go to Home Depot, get a charging station and put it in. However, when we move to a fleet and we move to levels of service and requirements of operation, and then we start moving up into bigger vehicles, it's not quite that easy. Um, it is particularly not that easy for our folks who are looking at adding highly electric appliances, vehicles, to a building that might have been built in 1960, mm. back before there were computers and copy machines. And they really need to look at what that's going to do to their overall building efficiency and, and energy needs, and um, how they're going to make sure, again, they're providing those vital services on days that we are having rolling blackouts, or days that their power might go out. The good news is that we have solutions for all of those, and we know how to do that now, and we know how to plan for what will be wider spread electrification in the future. Um, one thing that we tell of our clients all the time is, it's not a light switch. We're not talking about doing everything tomorrow, but we are asking you to plan for tomorrow to, and implement today that sets you up in a position that you are ready for that tomorrow. So is it the best move really for these types of companies, call it a mid-sized business, maybe they have one or two large facilities and they're thinking about electrifying, are these groups that really need to involve all of these parties or really should there be really one shot caller just making these kinds of decisions at any particular facility to, to move forward on progress here? I think like anything that is a substantive change in a business, it's going to have lots of people who are weighing in. And when one person is calling the shots and saying, this is what we want to do, even though that they are super smart and well-intentioned, there may be a missing piece of information that they don't have. So one group we like to have people involved is HR, and we don't really think about that. But you may have employment contracts or union folks that have certain requirements, we wanna meet those. How about your attorney um, and legal and making sure that what we're doing is meeting conditions of a lease or is adhering to some other uh, insurance requirements that the business may have. So we really like to get all of the folks in the room at the one time, have one big meeting and understand what everybody's goal is and what everybody's fear is, and uncover any little issue. I think about it kind of like unpacking uh, nesting dolls. Let's find the little doll, let's solve the little doll and put, put it back together again. Um, for a lot of businesses, the, the person that is missing from their conversation is the IT department. Mm. Um, you know, we get down the road a little bit and then all of a sudden, oh my God, our network will not support this. Or we need this data to mesh with this other system. So let's get them involved in the beginning too. Or we have some obligation for data reporting. Maybe we got some of this grant funded or we need access to cloud-based solutions or maybe we want this system to integrate with our building efficiency system or whole host of reasons to incorporate everybody. I love the idea of incorporating HR. That's something I hadn't thought about before. Um, so the good takeaway there is, you know, people moving this forward involve everybody from the beginning. Get the larger group together. Not that you have so many cooks in the kitchen, but make sure you're incorporating everybody from uh, the C-suite, potentially all the way down to people operating this equipment on a day-to-day -day basis and get their feedback and understanding on the input on the impact of uh, an electrification project because it seems it's much bigger than just converting a single piece of equipment from one fuel type to another. It, it is, and I just want to give you one little story on this, is that one of the early fleets that we worked with, um, their, 
they had a whole department full of people that were driving kind of bigger size SUVs. And we can't electrify those big SUVs right now. And it was like, oh no, they have to drive this. This is what they want. Until we went and talked to them and they said, actually, no, they would prefer to have really small compact cars because the big SUVs were ridiculously hard to park. And so suddenly there was an avenue to move them into something like a Chevy Bolt and they were happy to do it. So if we don't ask people, maybe we're, we're trying to replace the same tool with the same tool instead of finding a better solution. That's a great example. I think that's a term that uh, is commonly referred to as right sizing. Is that right? Where you right size a particular vehicle for a particular application. And it seems especially true or especially needed in the electrification sector where uh, there might be a whole host of vehicles that could be perfectly suited for a particular operation, but because they've been using a big box truck for a certain operation, that that's what they think they need. Um, th- th- that's uh, certainly true. Do you, uh, how, do you, how do you think uh, a fleet operator should go about that? Does that mean uh, you know, doing some test drives? How do they incorporate the, the idea of right-sizing into what they're doing? We've, you know, it really depends upon the fleet, and I hate that answer. I hate it when people say <laughs> it really depends. I'm going to tell you it really depends. Um, of the fleets that we've worked with, 100% of them have said we don't need to right size, and 100% of them have said uh, we always retire our vehicles at 10 years and 100,000 miles, and 100% of them don't do that. <laughs> so we really first want to look at what types of practices and policies are, are written down and what we're doing and what we're what was written and what we're doing in the real world. And oftentimes what we find is the policy doesn't match the practice because the practice has already evolved. Um, You know, we're already have traded vehicles back and forth because I don't want to drive that big one. I want that little one. We already are using something that was designed for task A to do task B because it's better suited. So when we start looking at how practices are put in place, then we can start doing some recommendations for right sizing, downsizing, retiring, replacing, changing things out. But it's really important that the people who are doing the job are involved in that decision so that they don't feel it's being done to them. You know, the two things that people, uh, those of us who are driving cars, we're driving cars to work. The people in fleets, the, the car, the truck, that is their work. And the two things that they're most worried about are being stuck and having to wait. And so when we involve them in the decision-making and we, we find out how they are working and what we can do for them, we can help alleviate their concerns about being stuck and, or having to wait. Totally. Think outside the box truck, <laughs> the takeaway there. So I want to take this uh, one step further and maybe the progression of thinking for a fleet here. So say they've uh, maybe they've engaged a group like Frontier or they've made some decisions. They've put together their plan of attack here for some electrification and they're starting to move forward on the execution of that. They're starting to work through procurement of equipment or signing POs or they've done some analysis um, on what types of charging systems they want to do. Uh once those projects start to get underway, where are we really seeing them stall out? Are they stalling out? Where, uh, where are the real headaches right now that people uh, really should be thinking about? Well, unfortunately, the, the biggest gap right now is supply chain. Mm-hmm. And that's not, it's not just our industry and what we're doing. It is a nationwide, worldwide thing. We've had quite a shortage in precious metals, aluminum, copper, that go into everything else that makes this. Fortunately, I saw a presentation from a group that monitors supply chain uh, for for lots of industries, and they said they expect an easing to come in early next year. So hopefully with more aluminum coming back into the market, with the change in the copper supply, we'll see a lot of that supply chain be alleviated. But we are also seeing there's quite a delay in engineering with the utilities Mm. they have so many particularly here in california maybe not so much in other states uh, but that there's this idea that you can just say hey utility do i have enough capacity for this and they can't answer that you know i want to use an analogy i love analogies think of your electrical capacity kind of like your outlook calendar for the week you can look two weeks ahead and go look how much you know Man, I got whole days here when nothing's booked and I have time to spend. And then it suddenly just fills up. You and I had a lot of hard time just scheduling our meeting because our calendars filled up. 
So that's what the electrical grid looks like too. It could look like you have plenty or it could look like you don't have enough. And then tomorrow it all changes because meetings got scheduled, meetings got canceled. So knowing that we have to work really, really closely with the, with the utility, they need a little time and they're overwhelmed as well. So those are the things that we're seeing. So my overall thing, what I would say is just assume that this is going to take longer than you think. But once we get over this first hurdle, again, we're doing things for the first time. Once we get over the first hurdle, the next ones are going to go faster. And then they're going to go faster because you're going to gain efficiencies with, with deployment. Yeah, absolutely. Engaging your local utility is something that we also often very much encourage as early as possible, even if you don't have your hands fully around your particular project yet. Um, out here on the West Coast, especially in California, we're really lucky to have a lot of utility make ready programs where they help buy down a lot of the cost or sometimes the whole cost of that infrastructure going into your building. Uh, but again, a very, very long lead time uh, to get those projects uh, uh, you know, to break ground sometimes. So I agree with that wholeheartedly. Get that utility involved as quickly as possible. Uh, but it does sound like there is some light at the end of the tunnel here on supply chain constraints. And so looking towards the end of next year, some of these precious metal issues might be going away. Manufacturing is seeing an uptick. I know the uh, Inflation Reduction Act is helping bring some manufacturing uh, back to the United States to hopefully alleviate some uh, some timeline constraints. Um, so uh, some light at the end of the tunnel for, for the project. Um, and it sounds like uh, maybe if uh, that is the current uh, you know, speed bump in this whole road right now. Uh, it makes sense for folks to really, I don't know, if get, do they get in line at this point? Uh, how do they work with uh, the people that are most affected by supply chain? There again is that it depends answer. Mm -hmm. um, for most of the folks that we're working with, they are not planning on running out to the dealership and buying a vehicle and going to the hardware store and putting in a charger. They too are on their own timelines and those timelines have to include budget years and the availability of incentives and for uh, businesses, for-profit businesses, they have to think about um, the, uh, keep wanting to call it infrastructure relief. The inflation relief uh, will have a lot of new tax credits. Mm -hmm. So we've actually seen some projects go on hold because why would they do them now when they can wait a little bit and get the tax credit? So what I would say is, this is the time to really plan and come up with that plan. And what do you need to do while you're planning? The first is to collect as much data about your vehicles as you possibly can. So the number of miles it drives on an average week is not enough data. We really wanna know what the duty cycle looks like. And that is how much the engine is running. Um, and what is the engine doing when it's running? Is it hoisting a crane? Is it pushing a snow plow? Is it a police car that's sitting idling and running a, a light bar and a computer the whole time? And then where does that vehicle stop and for how long does it stop? And at those places when it's stopping, what does the energy use look like there? And what are you doing now with, you know, what does your, your curve look like of your energy use? And do you already have places that you're coming super close to hitting a high point and how can we shift the loads in the building? And what building facility improvements do you have coming in the next two years that we might also slide in charging station improvements in that time too? So don't just sit and wait for the supply chain to loosen up. This is the time that you are planning kind of like a vacation of a lifetime <laughs> um, and how you're going to get there. Yeah, I'd love to go to Hawaii for this, but the uh, zero emission uh, votes are, I think, a little bit far away. But I, I agree with that. And I, I think, uh, you know, it's important to ensure that, you know, the, the people in this decision making power, they don't need to make it extremely complicated either, I think. Right. I think back to your point where uh, the idea of engaging the people using this stuff on a day to day basis will know a lot of that information offhand because they're doing it. They're the ones in the operation in the field. And so engaging those folks to uh, report back on what they're doing during the day, where they're going, how they're working. You know, I think they could probably shed a lot of insight into uh, into that and can really add you get you to the maybe the, the 90 yard line on your plan. Um, without the need for really expensive, fancy tracking technologies or fleet analytics and all sorts of stuff, which might be really useful, but you can get a lot of info back just from your own internal operations as they stand today. 
You can, and by asking people and rewarding them with pizza. <laughs> and a brew or two. Um, so uh, I, I just want to take a, a, one more broader look here, again, maybe at the midsize facility level where that particular person or that particular group of people Fleet electrification is a big, big part of it. Um, but at the same time, they're also kind of maybe coming at this from a greenhouse gas reduction level or a cost benefit level or energy efficiency level or any sort of myriad of things or a mix of those things um, that they're being tasked with. And, and transportation is not just it. And um, so I'd love to hear a little bit more about what other big considerations are there, um, you, you know, when it comes to those particular areas that should be part of this calculus when trying to figure out what to do um, holistically, especially when they're talking about major facility upgrades for the utility, when you know they're trying to plan for not just charging stations, but maybe other stuff. Sure, so first let me say, Frontier Energy has a bunch of tools that we're willing, happy to share with you to help you start planning. So some of those are some inventory sheets of what do you need to collect from your vehicles and how. And another one of them is, what do we want to look at at your facility? And what are you thinking about? And what should you collect with that? And it's more than just what does your meter data look like, but it, it also includes, are we planning a big capital improvement in the facility? Are we going to move in the next three years? Are we doing anything else? The third thing that I really want to emphasize is that fleets should also be thinking about their employees and their customers at the same time. And we have some toolkits that you that include some surveys and planning checklists for providing charging for your workforce. And are there opportunities that we could build once and let employees as well as the fleet use uh, those charging stations, which really then you talk about TCO really helps your TCO. Um, the third thing that we really want to do is to start looking longer term at how you're going to transition your building systems into electric. In many cities across California and in other states, they are looking at building electrification ordinance that will phase out natural gas. And are there opportunities for us to do things now that can decrease your energy efficiency while moving you to all electric and prepare you to put in these vehicles? And the last thing I'm going to say is, do not just close your eyes to the other options out there. For many use cases, hydrogen is going to be a better choice than putting a charging station. And in places that have renewable diesel, which is not biodiesel, and renewable natural gas, those are drop-in fuels that you can put in today. They're not electric, but it's going to decrease your carbon footprint. So again, a lot of night, not a light switch. It's a journey, and there are many steps along that journey that help us get to where we want to go. Absolutely. That's uh, really sage advice, Chris. Um, again, we are not at the full-fledged gold rush here, but somewhere in between. And I know a big part of that is a transition to fully uh, zero-emission technologies at some point, and that does include a, a mix of solutions for us as we make that whole transition. Chris, thank you again for coming aboard the uh, charge cycle also to frontier energy we're going to be more than happy to include some of the links that you had mentioned to your tools and your resources in the show notes uh to the listener thank you for tuning into the charge cycle where we talk all things fleet electrification uh we'll be back next week and until then get out there and get plugged in <laughs>